Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Elevate 2021 podcast series. My name is Gerda Muller, and I am your Elevate 2021 host, and so excited to have a special guest here with us today, the lovely Dr. Tess Crawley. Welcome, Tess. Thank you, Gerda. Always lovely to talk to you, I have to say. (laughs) Always, always. So um, what I'm going to ask you to do, Tess, uh, because obviously I know you pretty well, Mm -hmm. but there might be a lot of people listening that don't know you that well. So can you Mm -hmm. introduce yourself to anybody that might be listening? Tell us who Mm -hmm. you are, what you do, and what it is that drives you to do that. Sure can. Okay, so I am a clinical and forensic psychologist. I own a practice called the Crawley Clinic, which started in Tasmania, in Hobart, um, back in 2009. I've since sold the Hobart practice. I have a second arm of the Crawley Clinic, which is now the only real arm of the Crawley Clinic in Launceston. And um, I have a team that is spread over Tasmania and I have some staff members in Melbourne as well, which is where I'm based now. Um, In addition to running the clinic, Um, And it's a multidisciplinary clinic. So we have psychologists, social workers, mental health OT. um, I think that's a provisional psychologist as well uh, on board. So in addition to running the clinic, um, I am a private practice slash business entrepreneur, uh, business coach. So I do a lot of work working with business owners and talking to business owners about all sorts of things to do with Uh, coping with the ups and downs of business, the overwhelm, the stress, the fear, as well as the practical side of running a business. I think that's probably, and the main reason I do it, I think it's because I've been where most of my clients are when they come to me, you know, in that terribly isolated and scary place. So, you know, it's quite, it's become quite the passion work for me, you know, helping people climb out of that horrible hole that they inevitably fall into if they stay isolated. Hmm. Yeah, uh, yes, business ownership is mm. most certainly a difficult journey, made even more difficult if you do it alone and if you are isolated. Um, so I must say, just listening to that list of stuff, you must be pretty busy, and yet you still are making time to join mm. us at Elevate 2021 this year. So I'm super uh, happy. Yeah. thanks for putting us in your diary um so obviously you were there last year when we had the virtual elevate 2020 and uh you want your presentation was one of the most popular i think based on the feedback um so you are coming back therefore Mm. of course because it was a possible uh, popular, I just had to get you back but tell us what's going to be your topic for this year yeah, thanks. I, I am really excited to come. I can't remember the last time I was on a plane, so I'm a little bit excited, I have to say, and staying in a hotel and all. I've got that sort of giddy feeling about coming. Um, so everybody has to behave themselves so that nothing stops me from being there. Yes. Uh, the topic, I'm going to talk about um, a concept that I've talked, I've talked about this more in an introductory sort of version of the concept of, of what is a CEO mindset pretty much what I talked about um, last year. This year, I'm, I'm advancing it a little, if you like, and talking more about you know, how to adopt a CEO mindset in uncertain times. People feel that being a CEO means you've got all your shit together. And um, you know, how can I possibly call myself a CEO or a director or any other kind of grown-up word in my business if I feel like I'm constantly being buffeted about? And we're living in a world where everybody's being buffeted about at the moment. So being able to adopt some of those mindset will overcome some of those mindset challenges and really step into that CEO framework in terms of how you look at your business, how you see your role, how you um, communicate with team and staff and someone like that. It's, 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 it's so important, I think, that business owners understand what all of that means so that they can more confidently adopt that leadership role and stop treating themselves like their business's general dog's body. Yeah. Uh, they actually they actually need to step up a little bit more in terms of how they see themselves because that helps them run their businesses better. 100%. And I think, mm. you know, the topic being um, a, a CEO mindset in uncertain times is so um, pertinent right now because I think um, 
for us as helping professionals, who is the main audience at Elevate, already have a difficult time stepping into the CEO mindset. Yeah. Now, bring in uncertain times, uncertain variables, it, uh, uh, most of which we can't control, it makes it even harder. And it's so easy to be drawn into that operational side of things again yeah. during these times. So I think it's so vital for us to be having this conversation, which I guess also segues nicely into my next question is, when you think about the audience at Elevate, being allied health, mental health professionals, of course, there's team members that might be there, a lot of them are practice owners. Um, what is that top one or two reasons that you think it is important for them as a practice owner to embrace the CEO mindset? I think first and foremost, uh, this belief that we have to do everything ourselves. The number one mistake I think business owners make is not delegating enough or soon enough. And this belief that we have to do everything ourselves, because there's a whole lot of emotions tied into delegating. Yeah, you know, we feel guilty mm. if we're if uh, and lazy if we're mm. asking somebody else to do to do something that we could do ourselves. And so, because we could do it ourselves, we tell ourselves we should do it ourselves, and we just grind ourselves down to the bone. So, you know, you hear about practice owners up till 11 o'clock at night dealing with admin, working across all their, their weekends, dealing with admin and paperwork and staffing issues. When they promised themselves when they went into business that they were doing it so they had more time for their family. Yeah. And yet here they are stealing time from their family yeah. to continue to do everything themselves. So uh, I ran some I actually ran a survey recently asking questions about people's issues with their businesses and the vast majority of people were, 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 were saying that their number one concern was time management and related to that, you know, how to delegate and who to delegate to. So, you know, it is a burning problem. Um, and I think that first tackle, the first issue that really needs to be addressed is this belief that I must do everything myself. It's absolute nonsense, mm. absolute nonsense. From right down from therapy assistants who can help us with our with our wait list instead of feeling we have to take every client ourselves, mm -hmm. right through to um, you know uh, students who can help us draft reports. There's so many things that we can do mm -hmm. that uh, we can delegate, but we don't because we feel we're going to get in trouble, we're going to get in, um, you know criticised by our peers, we'll get reported to APRA. And of course, none of those things are going to happen because you're still going to be a professional acting professionally, making ethical decisions. You're just mm. going to share the workload around. Yeah. There's so many emotional stuff, right, mm. that, that plays into that, the fear, the guilt, the uncertainty mm. of not knowing. And, and when there's uh, so much emotional uh, connections to having to engage in certain behaviors, that's when we stay stuck. That's yep. when we stay stagnant because then we just don't do anything. And then it's three years later and they're still staying up at night doing exactly the mm -hmm. same thing. So the way that I see what it is that your topic will help as well is really to help practice owners achieve that dream they had when they started, right? That dream of flexibility, of having uh, more time than, than I had previously while still earning the same money. And, you know, if you don't do this the right way and allow yourself to do things like delegate, then that's mm. never going to happen. And you're not going to have that dream, which is that's a possibility. Right. It is possible. People do it every day. You, you're a prime example of that, right? Mm. And it's about working through those emotions by stepping in into that CEO mindset space. Mm. Um, and I guess a lot of people ask, how do I do that? Well, that's what this presentation is going to be all about. Yeah. Right? <laughs> exactly right. Exactly right. And it's, and it's, you know, and it's not as difficult as people feel like I'm asking uh, or fear that, you know, I'm asking them to take on a, a title that they don't deserve. Mm. Uh, you know, see the term CEO, oh, that's preserved for corporations. What's that got to do with my small little business, especially if I'm a business of one? Yeah. And this is why, you know, talking about CEO mindset, I don't care how many people you have below you in your organisation. You have to adopt this attitude of knowing when you are in chief operating mode, so doing all the daily responsibilities, mm -hmm. and when you must be in that strategic, future-oriented CEO mode of thinking um, so that you can make the daily decisions that meet the strategic long-term goals. 
So it's about understanding the different hats we're required to wear in our businesses. Yeah. More than sort of just taking on a mantle. It's, it's not just about a title. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And I wonder if, if you find this as well, that, you know, when people have, for example, when it comes to increasing fees, right? A lot of times mm. people struggle with making the decision and then they do decide to increase their fees. They go through the process and they go, oh, geez, I should have done that a long time ago. Yeah. You know, nobody, nobody left. Nobody had a tantrum. It was all good. Why was I so worried about it? Right. And I, and I think it's very similar with stepping into the CEO mindset that once a person decides to do it and they start acting from that space, they look back and go, okay, <laughs> you know, yeah. it's, it's yeah. actually not as hard as I thought it is. It's actually, you know, it's like this weight is lifted off my shoulders. All these mm. things are no, now, you know, I've got more possibilities, more opportunities. Mm. This is actually a great space to be in. That's right. It's, it's so true. And I think it comes down to so many, there are so many areas in our businesses where, you know, even, you know, recruiting administrative staff to support you right at the very early stages of your business growth, people put that off for so long because they overestimate what it's going to cost and they underestimate their ability to pay it and that's again linked to their fee structures there are so many layers to these delays and uh, you know we call it a delegation problem or we call it a time management problem or we call it a revenue stream problem it doesn't matter what label you put on the reasons why you're not stepping into the next stage of your business and getting the help you need it all starts with how you view yourself and your business and where you see your business going in the future and then acting accordingly. Basically, it means holding your breath, cross your fingers behind your back and take the bloody leap and do the thing that's going to help you support your business to stay afloat. Yeah. And that's scary. <laughs> it is, right? But it's doing that thing that we are probably asking our clients to do on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And that is to step out of side of that comfort zone to, to exactly. take that, that leap of faith. And a lot of the times it's faith in ourselves that we can do it. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so we know it's a big ask, but we also know that people can most certainly do it. Mm -hmm. So true. Yeah. So true. All right. So tell me next is a more personal question. Mm -hmm. So what failure have you personally experienced in your practice or business that your topic will help our attendees to avoid? Oh my God, all of them. <laughs> um, but I've made all of the mistakes. I've had all of the failures and I still make mistakes and I still have failures. Um, so I think the number one failure I, I'd um, say they will avoid is assuming that there are no more failures to be had, because I think that when we talk about failures, we, it sounds so final and so finite. Uh, I think that we try things and it doesn't work out. We learn from it. Mm -hmm. So I think in my business in particular, probably the one, the one thing that when they're Gosh, you asked me to pick one. And every time I think I've picked one, another one pops into my head. But yeah. the, the first thing I think is, um, is around staffing decisions. Mm. And if I think back to the earliest thing I wish I'd done differently or wish I'd thought about differently is probably a better way to frame this. Mm -hmm. um, I felt I was in such a rush to have my business be the biggest. And what I wasn't conscious of, uh, you know, I got excited. I think I got a bit overexcited about the growth and the potential and all of those things and the people who wanted to work with me and all of that stuff was really, really exciting. Mm -hmm. But I was at the time very, very reactive to on the spot decisions without a thought really about the strategic longer term, um, how it was gonna look, how it was gonna play out. So when it comes to staffing now, I'm really encouraging people to think long-term, to think vision around, you know, what do you want your practice to, what do you, what do you want your team to feel like? Mm. Not how many names do you want on your website? Mm. What do you want your team to feel like? And backward engineer from there. So thinking about, you know, people always say, what's better, uh, contractors or employees? And there's no right answer to that. The only right answer is the one that fits your strategic longer term view of how you want your team to feel. Yeah. So my team has never been more stable, more happy, more content, more a joy to spend time with than they have since I made a conscious decision mm -hmm. to change my thinking about how I recruited, who I recruited and, and focus more on culture than on numbers of names on websites. 
Mm. And that was probably the turning point for me. And I remember distinctly in a very difficult time in my business, making that conscious decision when, you know, panic was telling me to recruit desperately fast. Anyone will do just get bums on seats. Yeah. But I made a very conscious decision to slow that down and get strategic and culture based. So that's probably, I guess, a good example. But I still make mistakes every day. I still have, we still as a team have stuff ups every day. Um, in fact, I'm about to message one of my clients telling her I've made a mistake about something and we'll fix it. You know, we all still make mistakes and we all still learn from them. So it's really important to, I, I use the analogy of watching a toddler learning to walk. You know, if a toddler never fell over, they would never learn to walk properly. So, you know, we all need to fall over every now and then or stumble every now and then. Yes, totally agree because, you know, that saying another level, another devil. Um, with each stage of growth, you're going to have mm. challenges. And if you've mm. never faced that challenge before, or you don't have somebody in your corner, such as a mentor or a coach that can tell you what to look out for, you know, yeah. there might be another failure, but there's always going to be another challenge and you're going to learn from it. That's the important thing, right? Oh, that's my um, reminder to say I need to change my flights to somebody's retreat, midwinter retreat. I will oh, have yes. to do that. I wonder whose retreat that might be. I wonder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but all my reminders going off. Although it's on silent, the, remind, the alarms and reminders will go off. Um, you know, so it, it's about knowing every stage mm. of growth has an extra challenge. And, you know, that was a great um, example that you also used because I think um, what a CEO does is think strategically, is think yes. long term, is think vision whereas if you're just in operator mode it's just like there's a hole there's a client on a wait list I need to fill this hole and get clients to come um mm -hmm. be treated mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. um and biggest mistake ever we both know it we've yep. both, both made that I've made it <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's like what is that saying that you need to make this mistake almost it's like uh I don't know there's some other English saying that I can't think of right now um I'll, it'll probably come back to me once we're done here but it's like it, it's such a common mistake so i also think you know we don't want to give ourselves too much of a hard time as long as we are learning from it okay. yes sometimes there are some lessons that i've personally found i had to learn more than once because mm -hmm. i can be a bit stubborn but mm -hmm. you know eventually mm -hmm. it sticks and yeah. You know what what you've spoken about your learning um and the fact that you have grown from it uh you know is testament in the fact that this year of course your practice is a finalist yes australian allied health awards in i believe the team culture category that's right so congratulations thank you very that. much i have to say i am so proud of that you know that we are a finalist in that category and um and that's uh, having been a finalist for psychologist of the year i am i have to say i'm more proud of this this um being a finalist in this particular category because it's one of my core values it has become the core value of my team nothing makes me happier than when i hear from my team members this is the best job i've ever had or i've never felt so supported or you know they're asking they're asking me can we spend more days working with you mm -hmm. you know these are the this is the culture that has grown out of all of the learnings that you know that i've made over the years through other team-based decisions mm -hmm. i really understand people's desperate need to recruit at the moment i think it, it it's 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 understandable the the demand that's in the community right now and i'm seeing a lot of solo um, practitioners suddenly swamped with referrals and not knowing which way to turn and making desperate decisions around recruitment that I wish I could hit a pause button for them. Um, I think that uh, they now suddenly they swamped so they stressed out of their you know off their heads with the um, the referral numbers they're getting but they're also um, now suddenly throwing themselves into team management mode as well but they don't have time to do that because they're their caseload is full up to the eyeballs. And so they're, they're spinning, you know, they're just freaking out completely with, I've got so many responsibilities now and I haven't said no to anything yet um, because I'm scared that it's all gonna stop one day and I'll have no referrals again. So there's so many pressures and fears and demands coming at them from every single angle um, that I, you know, I do understand their desperation, but I encourage them to pause and stop and think, what's what's the key what's the key strategic decision to be made next by all means recruit but recruit smartly 
Oh yeah, one hundred percent. And I think you're touching on another important quality of having a CEO mindset, and that is the mm. ability to say no, but yes. also to say no to opportunities. Because yes. people see that as an opportunity to service the waiters to mm -hmm. now expand my practice, yes. but the, the timing needs to be right. And I can't remember who said this, but someone like a clever person said that opportunities is like um, a bus um, at the bus stop. There's always another one coming, right? Yes. And you need yes. to know which is the right bus to get on. You need to know. I when think to get that's on true. And, and yeah. wait to get off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's true. It's like, you know, uh, Richard Branson's um, advice around say yes to everything and, and work out the details later. I do agree with that in some sectors, not mm -hmm. with staffing. Mm -hmm. So if you have an opportunity to, uh, I don't know, um, run a workshop and you've got no idea what the topic is, but you, you know that this is going to be really good for your exposure and for your business, by all means, say yes, work out the details later. If you're being asked to recruit someone and your gut is telling you they're not the right fit, don't say yes and work out the details later. Listen to your gut because you, you know your gut is telling you they're not the right fit for a reason. Yes. So it's, a, it's what we say no to is as important as mm -hmm. what we say yes to. We need to be, be very strategic and smart in those. Mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. Totally. And I, and I love that you mentioned that because I think very often when people might be hearing CEO mindset and thinking, oh, that means I need to be really rational and logical no. and yes, you need to be all that stuff but you still need to trust the gut you yes it, and more so more so the interesting thing the interesting uh. thing about you know um mm. entrepreneurs who you know we you and i are our own worst enemies and people like us we're all our own worst enemies because we go into business thinking we're going to be free you're going to have all this time we're going to we get that sorted out then we go oh what can i do next and then we go to that next level and then we go oh now what and we go to that next level and as long as we're being strategic it's great but we we are always at risk of not having as much freedom and flexibility as we thought we were going to have the point about the CEO mindset as it relates to that is we're actually very creative thinkers. We're very instinctual. We are, we're a bit like fortune tellers in a weird, crazy way in that we can see in our own industries, we can see what's coming mm -hmm. and we can anticipate what's needed in our industry and we can implement things um, that support our communities or some support our colleagues or, or our team because we've got that sort of, that sort of visionary kind of element to how we see the world and how we see our, our particular area of expertise. So there's a place for being rational, absolutely. And I'm not saying the flip side is you be irrational, mm -hmm. but I do believe 100% that we are time, time, time and time again, I'm saying I told you so to clients of mine when they have finally learnt to trust their instincts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that definitely plays out in staffing, but it plays out in lots of ways. Yeah. And, um, you know, and I think, I think that we aren't very good at listening to our gut initially, mm -hmm. but we get better at it the more we trust ourselves to make the right decision and the right choice. And we listen to that in our inner voice that's guiding us if we listen to that instead of all the shoulds we'll do a much better job yeah 100 percent. okay so tell me then i mean we've touched a bit on this but what is um that one thing if you could go back in time in our magic time traveling machine uh, what is the one thing that you would do differently in your part? i would have got support support sooner hmm. um i would have got support a lot sooner hmm. um you know i'm constantly in awe of new practice owners and I've had a, a few of them now new, brand new practice owners who come smartly to whether it's me or you or whoever mm -hmm. and say I'm opening a practice I know I'm going to need some help getting this right I'm in and I just think wow you know I wish when I started private practice similar to to when you did you know it was a different landscape and finding support and help was was much harder um, being in Hobart I mean we're talking about pre uh, we weren't really pre Facebook but but we were certainly pre using social media as a tool for support and connection professionally 
mm. and um, you know, so there was there were very the only people really around were clinical supervisors who have a very different take. Yeah, and they were supportive, and I did get some good mm. business advice, but but it wasn't the same as getting proper business coaching, and so I wish I'd had access to that sooner. So mm. those people coming into business now, you've got access to it. It's here. It doesn't have to be me. It doesn't have to be Gerda. It's here. There are more and more people offering this as a service. Find the person who you feel is the right cultural fit for you and, mm -hmm. and invest in your business in that way because you will... The mistakes that I've made over and again, the mistakes that you've made, the mistakes that so many of us have made ha have actually fed into what, what lessons we can teach as well as, you know, what skills we can share. Yeah, I can, I can so much relate to that. I mean, when I started my practice in 2007, I didn't even know there was such a thing such as business coaching. No. Who knew that even no. existed, right? I didn't. And when I now know what business coaching mentoring does, I think I was a fool, right? I wish I had it. I, I was three years in before I met the first business coach ever. That changed my, the, my life, really, because it mm change the trajectory of my business which is life changing right yeah, yeah and it's made such a difference and and when i see new practice owners i just want to tell them i, I know it's an investment of time and money but it mm. is so so worth it because mm. uh, even in my book i answer that question if i could go back and yeah. my thing was i would hire a business coach day dot because mm -hmm. it would would have made my life so much easier oh so much easier and i and i think the traps that you fall into when you're learning by doing there's nothing wrong with learning by doing you learn some really good lessons but the traps that you can fall into when you're learning by doing on your own is you the, the number one trap really is that sustained isolation mm. and feeling that you have to know all the answers especially for your team mm. feeling that you should you're the boss therefore you should know the answers you should be responsible for everything you should be doing all of the things and that's a really nasty mindset trap to find yourself stuck in. Um, I see lots of practice owners when a staff member leaves, their first response is to say, oh, well, then I have to take on all their clients because I don't have anyone else. It's like, no, stop right there. Stop, stop, stop right there. Um, you know, then an, then an admin staff member leaves, oh, well, then I have to sit on reception because I don't have a new admin team member yet. Well, hang on. You just taken on everyone's clients and now you're going to sit on reception and you've got your own caseload and you're trying to manage your stuff and you've got a family or a partner or a pet or a life. Mm -hmm. It's just not possible to live successfully and sustainably as a business owner, let alone keep your business afloat. If you don't start coming out of that isolation, that belief that you have to do everything yourself, that it is your responsibility to plug all the gaps and just step back from that get some support around you. The nice thing I feel with, um, especially the group programs I run, is seeing that connection and seeing people's eyes at various stages of business experience. Their eyes sort of pop a little bit when they realise, ah, oh, I'm not the only one who has experienced that or I'm not the only one who feels that way. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's, it's important. I'm very upfront, you know, with my Like a Boss crew, um, that's my, my top tier of business coaching. Um, yeah, you know, I tell them, I'm, we've made a major billing stuff up in my practice recently, which we're addressing now. And the great thing is that we've identified um, lots of good things have come out of it. Um, but it was a mistake that had been made. And, you know, I shared that with them. And, and, I, and I remember one of the girls saying, wow, you know, thanks so much. Thank mm -hmm. you so much for sharing that to us because I was demonstrating that I'm not perfect either. Mm -hmm. you know I drop the ball sometimes too mm -hmm. and we it's not the dropping of the ball it's how we're going to pick it up and how we're going to run even further with it now that we've identified the issue yeah yeah love that love that and and it's amazing that once you allow yourself to have the support and and yes. I think you know we are so naughty as helping professionals we yes. are so good at doing the helping but accepting it is such a big challenge yeah. for us huge but, but once people allow themselves to get that business help and support and they come into programs, groups, or even at, in a mm. conference, I remember last year's conference community was just so supportive and amazing. Mm. Uh, and what I really love is to see how supportive our people actually are. Yes, I'm yep. sure there's people that's not into that type of thing, but to see how giving people are, how generous they are, you know, not knowing one another from a bar of soap, just mm. in terms of helping, providing support, giving 
advice and input and recommendations. Not that I'm not that I would um, encourage anybody to take business advice off social media. No, but it's yeah. the support, right? That's um, right. The support that is so important, and I just love yeah. to see our allied health and mental health community starting to support one another mm. in much better ways, which is really really great. It is good. It is. It's really nice. Yeah, it is. And I think, you know, aligned to that is the, um, you and I have both talked a lot in the past about, you know, developing affiliate networks with other business owners around you so you can support each other, but also, you know, cross referral, all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and what I'm seeing now playing out, you know, with the demand that's going on in the community, but also the acceptance of telehealth within the community, I'm now seeing practices now starting to say, um, you know, happy to help you with your caseload by telehealth if that's of any benefit mm -hmm. or um, so-and-so saying, I've got a client with this condition, can anybody help? Telehealth would be fine. And, yeah. and we're seeing a lot more collaboration clinically as well now, which is really exciting for me. I think that um, I, see, I see the future as it is a very stressful time, but I do see some hope for that, you know, that connection. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. All right. So next question. Interesting one. What is okay. one of the things you are currently researching or focusing on? Dare I say it? Oh, my God. Um, well, now, well, I'm, now ah, I'm very curious. I <laughs> know. Oh well, I do have a secret. Um, currently, right this very minute, um, I've been researching um, you know, business owners' struggles and, what and how that plays out, which is, you know, I do have... Um, mm -hmm some things on offer at the moment which, which support those struggles around the CEO mindset stuff and so on. But I'm also uh, very concerned, I mentioned, you know, very concerned about um, the pressure that um, mental health professionals are under at the moment, given mm -hmm. the demand in the community. And so we uh, are currently, um, I've got the beginnings of a board. I've got lawyers uh, actioning, uh, putting paperwork in places that it has to go to, to create a not-for-profit. And I'm building a not-for-profit, um, I don't know what you call it, company, I guess it's a company, a not-for-profit. Anyway, we'll call it a not-for-profit <laughs> with the mission of supporting, um, of connecting private uh, sorry, I'll start again because I'm actually stumbling on my words because it's a bit of a secret. Um, okay, so we're building a not-for-profit with the mission to support the mental health of mental health professionals because there are a lot of barriers mm. to mental health professionals getting their own early intervention in particular. Mm. You and I have talked about this before, I know. If I needed mental health support, who am I going to ask? Because I know everybody and you're in the same boat. Yeah. So how do we find somebody who... Um, has enough experience, um, isn't in my network, which is bloody huge, yeah. and is available. Yeah. So I'm building a portal where, pe where people can do exactly that. Yeah. Um, they can find someone with enough experience. They can find someone who's not in their known network uh, yeah. who, who is available to support them. And it'll be um, for mental health professionals to seek early intervention mental health support yeah. from experienced clinicians. Wow. So it's a, it, that's what I'm currently working on. So that's big. And it is something that I am passionate about. I am very concerned mm -hmm. about the industry at the moment. I'm concerned about all these practice owners who are, uh, you know, spinning like tops because the demand is so huge. I'm concerned about the risk for burnout, both of them and team members in particular, if, if the support structures internally aren't mm -hmm. right because the practice owner hasn't quite got mm -hmm. their head around how to, how to do that. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a scary time. I think uh, I'm I'm concerned we'll see I'm concerned we'll see you know a, a loss of workforce capacity when we're already challenged in workforce capacity with very few people coming through to replace the people who are, who are moving out of the industry. So that's that's the story behind. You had to ask the question. That was a big story. <laughs> I feel so privileged that you get the inside scoop on that. The inside scoop. The inside wow. scoop. I know. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm, hang, I'm hanging out to be able to, um, you know, put visuals to the story. So I haven't talked about it publicly. It's it's um, my um, some of my clients know about it, but I haven't talked about it publicly because I have no visuals to put with it. What's that? We're out of time. My phone just randomly started playing music. It is so excited about <laughs> this initiative. Um, it is 
Last Christmas by Wham. It's not like a totally appropriate song, but it's just it's fine. I did it touch it, I promise. It's like, <laughs> well done. It's a great initiative. And thank you for sharing it here. That's okay. So watch this space. There'll be more, you know, once I've got got uh, more, you know, got all the legals sorted out, then I can start getting really loud and excited about it. Um, obviously, there'll be a lot of media attention. Once we get to that point, there'll be, um, you know, gunning for things like celebrity ambassadorships and all sorts of things. Like I'm pushing for this to be a, a real big thing because I feel really big about it and making it not for profit makes it easy for people to to be part of it looking at charitable status as well so people can donate um, for clinicians who find themselves in dire straits you know I find you know for example you know some practices on the in New South Wales during the bushfire last year who, who were nearly wiped out you know there they, they are big challenges that we face helping our communities and there's very little help in return for us individually and we saw that with finance packages during COVID where a lot of sole traders really missed out on any financial support even though they were struggling. Yeah it's gonna be really interesting to see um, you know the longer term effects. Yes with the yes industry. Um, uh, that's what worries me. You know, because if I think um, I, I work a lot of with large group practice owners and they've had to like be switched on and, and you know, lead during yep. COVID and it's like there's no end as yet. It's just yep. ongoing and ongoing and ongoing. And it's mm -hmm. like, when are we going to have a time to actually stop and just go, it's going to be OK? And mm -hmm. it's as if and when there's no deadline, it's you it's yeah. yeah I feel there's hope where currently it's like we don't know how long this is going to last no. and you know the potential for burnout and all that stuff is really concerning so I think again you know great initiative mm -hmm. it's also why you know my heart is and stuff like elevate to create opportunities yes. for people to get re-inspired reconnect mm -hmm. with other people get mm -hmm. re-motivated here that it's okay to fail right mm -hmm. that it's okay mm -hmm stuff up that it's uh, okay to delegate that it's okay to take two weeks off the practice will be fine right you'll exactly. be fine if you take time exactly. for yourself it's so important and and I and I guess that's what me and you advocate for a lot and fight for really for mm -hmm. our people is for them to say that it's okay for me to sit back and just let go and relax and take a breath yes. and do what I need to do so important yeah exactly okay so tell me what did you love most about being part of last year's elevate experience so you've already had the experience a lot of people might be listening they've never come to elevate what did you love most about uh, being part of elevate i loved i loved the coming together of people um you know all the speakers who we all came together to to really help business owners there's so little in in the mental health sector in particular there's so little around how we be better at the business of mental health and and I really I just really felt that it was something special I felt I felt very very privileged to be part of it um I really did enjoy knowing that um the stuff I talked about hit hit a chord like I, I really or struck a chord I really that that was deeply satisfying to me it's it's I guess it's nice when you're feeling passionate about something to discover that it's actually not just you being you know mm. stuck in your own head and thinking your own thoughts but it actually resonates with other people as well so that was really special so I'm looking forward to this one yeah oh, wait. me too all right so tell me if if there's somebody listening to us today or they may be watching the, the video on youtube or on facebook and they're like in two minds do i come do i not come obviously this year we have in-person tickets available mm -hmm. you know if that's a scary thought, thought for you though so i'll be there uh you know there's a virtual option as well and mm -hmm. people are going do i do i not commit whether that's in person or virtually what would your input be to them to help them make a decision about whether to attend or not I think just do it I think that it's such a rare opportunity like I said you know to get this level of input into your business in one big chunk and you know and god it counts towards your professional development it's there are so many reasons why this is important and we don't very often get professional development around our business ownership in mental health but just the collegiality Mm. itself was so is so special so if you can get there in person absolutely go um but a virtual ticket last year everyone was virtual and it was still a, it was an amazing experience mm -hmm. so I, 
it's just a no brainer. If you if you're looking at it and you're weighing it up up and down, well clearly it interests you. Mm. Just do it. Just do it. Absolutely. Totally agree. Just do it. That's the motto for today. Well, thank you so much for, thank you for uh, having me. Talking to me and talking to all our potential and already booked elevators. Uh, we're going to work really hard to make it an amazing event, whether that's um, whether people are coming in person or virtually. I think we did a pretty good job last year for the very first one. So this year is going to be even better. Uh, yeah, I look forward to seeing you there and catching up and hearing Thank about you. how the new initiative is going by the time you get there. Yes, I know. Gosh, yes. Who can say? Very exciting. Thank you very much for having me. I'm very excited to, to see you in September because it's been a long time too. <laughs> it has. It has. Thank you so much. Until next Bye. time. Bye. Thanks, Kata. Bye. <laughs>